All right. Did you ever stop to notice this crying earth, this sweeping shores? What have we done to the world? Look what we've done. I used to dream. I used to glance beyond the stars. Now I don't know where we are. Although I know we've drifted far, what about crying whales? We are rough. We are ravaging the seas. What about forest trails? Burn despite our place. Where did we go wrong? Someone tell me why. That is an excerpt from the lyrics of one popular song by Michael Jackson. Hi, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to our distinguished guests, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MOXIE Meet the Members webinar on the title Sustainable Development in the Oil and Gas Industry, The Way Forward. This webinar is organized by the MOXIE Sustainable Development Working Group and sponsored by Velesto Energy Berhad. I am Farah Ahmad. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Achieving the SDGs by the target 2030 will require cooperation and collaboration among government, non-governmental organizations, development partners, the private sectors and communities. The oil and gas sector is an important global industry and it can have both positive and negative impacts on a range of areas covered by the SDGs. Being one of pioneer association in oil and gas industry, Malaysia aim to be, sorry, MOXIE aim to be leading association that promotes the United Nations 2030 agenda for the sustainable development for the oil and gas industry in Malaysia. Today, we have our keynote speaker from UNDP who will be presenting on the SDGs and it is important to the oil and gas industry. Petronas President and Group Chief Executive Officer Tengku Mohd Taufik said, as the world contends with the many challenges brought ob about by energy transitions, Petronas is embracing its role in providing access to affordable, secure and sustainable energy to business and society. The group is committed to fulfill its purpose in providing cleaner energy solutions that benefits both the world we live as well as the customers we serve through reduced emissions. Today, we also have Chief Sustainability Officer of Petronas sharing on how sustainability is key enabler for value creations at Petronas. For a look at environmental, social and corporate governance, we have Felisto Energy Berhad and PwC Malaysia, whom are going to share the insight and relevant experience. Before we start, Allow me to share the webinar etiquette and a few important notes of the event. Please mute your microphone and please also turn off your camera. If you have any question, please use the chat box as I'll pick the question right after each speech. I would like to also encourage all of you to remain focused and stay until the end of the event, as we will also be having Kahoot session right after the closing remarks. There will be a Starbucks voucher worth 100 ringgit and 30 ringgit Eon voucher to be given away to the top three winners, sponsored by Aveva and Malaysia Airlines. Participants of the webinar can also earn 1.5 CPD hours approved by MBOT. Please complete the feedback form at the end of the event to get certificate. Typically, we start off with safety briefing. Since we are having this event virtually, we have a safety and quality moment. Let's go to the video, Remy. We think that uh, both masks and gloves are likely to pose a threat to marine wildlife. Um, gloves uh, are, off, are probably um, confused by animals like sea turtles uh, as food, as jellyfish, which is their primary food. You know, most masks have uh, loops for their ears uh, to go around your ears, and we think that that's likely to be an entanglement hazard uh, for uh, fish, for sea turtles, um, probably for seabirds as well.
tangled in a mat. All right. In conjunction with World Cleanup Day 2021 on 18 September and International Coastal Cleanup, the Little Club Malaysia, TLC Malaysia, with the support from Moxie and other partners, organized a virtual cleanup campaign, Cash for Trash, which conducted in Malaysia to encourage on the importance of picking up litter to save the oceans. The participants joined as individuals or community groups for cleaning activities and upload uploaded little report through mobile app and stand a chance to win a cash prize worth 5,000 ringgit. Please enjoy the Cash for Trash program montage video. What a fantastic initiative for better future of our next generation. Congratulations. All right, next. Without further ado, please join me. Welcome T.S. Sharifah Zaida Nolisha, our MOXIE president 
for her welcoming remarks. Thank you, Farah. Can you hear me? Yes, Puan. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Mr. Niloy Banerji, resident representative from Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, Darussalam. Salam, Nations Development Program UNDP, Ms. Charlotte Wolfby, Chief Sustainability Officer Petronas, Mr. Rohaizat Darus, President Valesto Energy Berhad, Mr. Nick Shariza Sulaiman, Risk Assurance Partner PWC Malaysia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, salam sejahtera and a very good morning to all MOXI members and attendees to the Sustainable Development in Oil and Gas Industry, the Way Forward webinar organized by the MOXI Sustainable Development Working Group or acronym SDWG. From a humble beginning as MOXI CSR Task Force Working Group now has been transformed into a full working group last year and renamed Sustainable Development Working Group SDWG. And among the objectives of MOXI SDWGs are to create awareness, knowledge and understanding of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 SDGs in the oil and gas industry, to promote activities that foster environment sustainability and human well-being within the oil and gas industry to provide a platform to facilitate sharing on sustainable best practices and innovation amongst MOXIE members. And there are many good programs and activities carried out or currently in the pipeline by this working group in support of the sustainable development agendas. Among them are, as you see just now, Cash for Trust program. Do enroll for that. IIUM project on community development for health and service as wellness, STEM innovation project from schools and university, and many, many, many others. So MOXIE provides a neutral and open platform for all and gas industry players, large and small, to work together to address common sustainability challenges. Together with our stakeholders, MOXIE will continue to support sustainable agendas and assist our policymakers to make informed policy decisions with valuable input from our 500 company members. For today's webinars, we are pleased to have an esteemed lineup of guest speakers representing the United Nations Development Program UNDP. We have Mr. Niloy Banerjee, the resident representative for Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei Darussalam, who will be giving later the keynote speech. This will be our second engagement with Mr. Niloy this year, and Moxie was happy to have him as a speaker during our inaugural Women in HSC conference in March this year. Thank you again, Mr. Niloy. Representing the National Oil Company Petronas, we have Ms. Charlotte Wufbai, who just recently joined Petronas as their Chief Sustainability Officer. Because this is a new position in Petronas, and with all the recent announcement, announcements from Petronas on sustainability, we are eager to hear from Ms. Charlotte on Petronas' direction. She will share on sustainability, a key enabler for value creation at Petronas. And Ms. Charlotte actually mentioned during the dry run that this will be her first external engagement in her new role. And she has a number of speaking engagements this week lined up. Moxie is honoured to be your first external engagement and hope that there will be more in the future now that we are acquainted and we thank you for agreeing to be with her with here with us and taking the time to share with moxie members from an ogse player point of view we have our very own none other moxie advisor mr rohaizat daros who is the president of valesto energy berhad he will share on balancing esg purpose and business performance from an oil and gas company that have implemented esg in the company remember guys esg is the buzzword now and finally to present on esg framework and governance we are pleased to have mr nick sharizal sulaiman a partner at pwc malaysia thank you to all speakers for giving us your time to be with us today and in conjunction with today's subject moxie is excited to announce that we will be collaborating and signing an mou with united nations global compact network malaysia ungc UNGC is the world's largest voluntary corporate sustainability initiative which aims to support companies to conduct business responsibly by aligning their strategies and operations with 10 principles that cover environment, labor, human rights and anti-corruption and encourages companies to take strategic actions to advance the United Nations SDG goals. 
The areas of collaboration with UNGC will include sustainability thought leadership engagements, digital learning libraries and UNGC Academy, accelerator programs, action labs, localized sustainability content and delivery, and tools and action plans. We look forward to a mutually beneficial collaboration with UNGC for the benefit of our members and the oil and gas industry. Do look out for more information and programs on this soon. And before I end my welcoming remarks, I would like to give a special mention to thank Valesto Energy Burhat for being our event sponsor today. Our deepest, deepest appreciation for this support, Mr. Rohaizad. And as an NGO, Moxie values and appreciate the generous support of companies to sustain Moxie as an independent non-profit industry association for us to be able to continue to represent the interests of our members. Thank you also to Aviva and Malaysia Airlines for sponsoring the vouchers that will be given out at the end of today's webinar during a Kahoot quiz. Stay on for that. I would like to also congratulate the Sustainable Development Working Group mentored by our exco Captain Mohammad Imran Mohammad Azmi and assisted by our Deputy Treasurer, uh, Treasury Secretary, Ms. Farah Ahmad, with their team for putting together today's webinar and with the support of none other than Moxie's very own Superman, alias GM, alias Mr. Rohaizli Hashim and Moxie Secretariat team for the smooth flow of today's event. Well done all. Moxie will continue to support and promote and share with the industry on sustainability through our collaboration with UNGC, as well as with Malaysia Petroleum Resources Corporation, MPRC, to develop the national OGSE sustainability roadmap. Now, this will be a long term plan for the industry, which will take a lot of effort and input from all stakeholders. Lastly, thank you to all in attendance, and I hope the presentations today will be beneficial for you and your company in moving the oil and gas industry forward. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And back to you, Farah. Thank you, Madam President. All right. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, form part of transforming our world. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted in September 2015 by the 193 United Nations Member States, the SDGs represent the world's comprehensive plan of action for social inclusion, environmental sustainability and economic development. Today, it's our privilege to have our keynote speaker for, from UNDP, Mr. Niloy Banerjee. Mr. Niloy Banerjee is a development economist with specialization in effective institutions and capacity development. He previously led the UN System Affairs Group in UNDP based in New York. In this position, he led UNDP's interface with UN agencies, funds, programs, and with member states in the arena of intergovernmental affairs. He has also led UNDP engagement in the round of UN reforms. Without further ado, please join me to welcome Mr. Niloy Banerjee, resident representative of UNDP, Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei Darussalam for his keynote speech. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Farah. Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Good morning. Puan Sharifa Zaida Nulisha, distinguished speakers, uh, members of MOGSI, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for having me here today. Uh, it's a special privilege because you're also having this event while, uh, while climate change uh, is being discussed quite intensely in New York uh, at the General Assembly that's uh, currently ongoing. And also, as you know, uh, the COP26, the C Conference of Parties, the, the first big sort of meeting that we are coming together for after the Paris Climate Agreement is happening later in the year. I'll, I'll come to it in, in, in a bit and, and, and give you a little bit of a flavor of uh, what that's looking like. But just by way of uh, big picture, wanted to uh, really congratulate Moxie and its membership, its leadership uh, of taking this uh, the sustainable development agenda head on. Uh, as you know, Globally, we are not not very well on track with uh, with the sustainable development goals. In fact, the preceding goals uh, that existed between 2000 and 2015, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, 
for those of you who are old enough, uh, as old as I am, <laughs> to, to remember, those were, we were by this time in the MDG era, we were much more on track to achieve those goals. Whereas this time around, uh, with the SDGs, we are not on track. It's uh, uh, of course that these goals are much more ambitious than the MDGs ever were, but still, um, it's it's uh, uh, the progress hasn't hasn't really been very encouraging so far. And what is worse, of course, is that uh, with the with the pandemic, we've now slid back on a number of goals, in, including most importantly on the poverty goal. Anyway, uh, I would just like to say, uh, colleagues, that uh, thank you for a big salute to you for taking the lead in influencing the energy sector in Malaysia. Um, and yes, uh, as as uh, Sharifa said, this is my second engagement with you, and and I always find. Uh, great forward thinking in 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 in, uh, in your community. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, that's very encouraging for us in the UN, who are otherwise always hearing gloom and doom news. Um, uh, one thing where you your role, colleagues, will be very important is as the as Malaysia's economy now um, uh, sort of rebounds from from the slump and from. From all the all, all the trauma it has faced this last uh, couple of years, your role in making the the rebound a little little more sustainable, a little more green, uh, and eventually shaping a, a greener trajectory would will be very very critical. Uh, there is absolutely uh, zero uh, doubt in my mind that you will. Uh, you will be there uh, playing your part and uh, you will be leading on um, as, as the industry reps, but also, uh, you know, it's, it's great when the voice comes from within the industry rather than from outside. Uh, so uh, here we are. Um, and uh, what we are seeing at the General Assembly, uh, colleagues, is, is a is uh, uh, almost no other topic is being discussed except these two, the, the, the build back better topic, but also, of course, endem uh, ending the pandemic topic. Uh, so uh, I am really, really hopeful and very, very optimistic that you'll be part of the build back better conversation. And uh, uh, I'm sure you're watching uh, global shifts and trends. Uh, and you will bring the best of that energy and knowledge. And please count on UNDP to 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 be your resource persons or to provide you any platform that you need to to get your message out uh, to a wider audience. So let me uh, pander shamelessly to Charlotte and first congratulate uh, Petronas for uh, for your declaring your zero um, net zero goals uh, by 2050. I think that's the kind of uh, leadership and exemplary behavior that we need to see in the industry. And as you know, also the, the big emitters, uh, uh, China and the US have also set their own targets. So overall, uh, big picture, it's looking, it's looking positive. I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm very optimistic yet, because as you know, uh, colleagues, to get to uh, we are putting about 52 billion uh, metric tons of uh, carbon in the in the air uh, every year, uh, and uh, it's not going to be easy to to come to net zero, uh, not least for various reasons that you know better than I: technology issues, uh, efficiency of of uh, space use, which I actually want to talk about a bit later in the in the in the talk. Um, uh, I, I was looking at uh, Petronas's 90 actions, uh, which uh, which you know guide the, uh, the the World Business Council for Social Development and Petronas's actions, and the roadmap uh, was it was very clear that it it says it touches a whole host of uh, SDGs uh, through through particular innovations in its own operations and supply chains. I think that's that's really key, absolutely key. And um, I, I, I saw that Petronas had listed uh, go, um, the health goal, the clean water goal, the energy goal, of course, uh, the decent work and economic growth goal, uh, innovation and infrastructure goal, climate action, and of course, the biodiversity and oceans goals, and, and the governance goal. So it'll be very interesting to hear Nick uh, speak uh, later this uh, later this uh, today on, on this topic. Um, 
final word uh, on this in this segment of what I'm saying is, uh, colleagues, uh, remember the bottom line of the SDGs is leaving no one behind. So please, uh, please do bear in mind the, the growing inequality in the world, uh, which is now beyond the traditional notions of income and wealth inequality. It's now spilling over into digital inequality. And uh, as you've now seen in the last uh, uh, six or eight months, there's a vaccine inequality uh, among countries and within countries. Uh, all of this uh, certainly keeps me awake at night, but uh, I hope it, it's something that you will uh, take back, discuss with your families, with your children, with your uh, friends. Inequality is something that we all, as a global community, need to pay big, big, big attention to. And again, your role will be, will be critical there. Let me segue then into what's happening with, uh, with the Conference of Parties and COP26. Um, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, uh, as you know, released its, the IPCC, uh, released its report uh, in, um, in August, two months ago. The report is, 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 is very, very depressing, colleagues. It's very depressing. The, our Secretary General, uh, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, uh, called the report a, a code red for humanity. Uh, and you can you can guess what that uh, what that uh, you know how alarmed we are about this in, in the UN. Um, we are not meeting the 1.5 C uh, Celsius warming goal, not by a long shot. Uh, we are. Uh, I mean, the report very clearly establishes that our activities, human activity, is driving extreme weather. It's, uh, the causality is getting increasingly evidence-based, and it's no longer uh, a topic of debate. Uh, regional um, warming, if you like, the Arctic uh, and, and the Northern Hemisphere in particular, are warming faster than, than the rest of the planet. Uh, another uh, big area of concern because obviously the the ice cap melt is a, is a big issue. But but in general, the disruptions to agriculture and food production and all the rest of it, um, and the change in patterns of pestilence and and and, and disease. Um, so overall, the report is telling us that we are reaching some tipping points which are uh, beyond the irreversible. Um, there are some good levers in the in the report as well. One is that we have uh, underestimated methane and it's you see methane is almost about uh, uh, four, four or five times more of a greenhouse gas than carbon. So uh, although methane emissions are much uh, lower globally except uh, except uh, in countries that are uh, dairy heavy uh, such as New Zealand. Um, uh, Methane emissions are uh, a tipping point. We could, if we, if we could manage, for instance, methane emissions, we would have um, we would have a significant dividend on on our net zero on our uh, net zero campaign. Um, the other thing that's kind of a mixed picture is, uh, you know, the the Paris Agreement encouraged countries to come with self determined. Uh, nationally determined uh, contributions, uh, commitments to to uh, uh, to re reducing greenhouse gases, and many countries have indeed come forward, including Malaysia. But the reason I call it a mixed picture is that it's not enough. The the level of ambition in these uh, in these NDCs, as we call them, uh, don't go far enough, and frankly. Uh, the indices that we have, the UN has seen so far, if you add them all up, between now and 2040, it, there, it amounts to 16% increase in greenhouse gas emissions, not, not, not any reduction at all. So that's why I'm saying there's not enough ambition in these indices. Um, as you know, there's a, there's a conversation between developed countries and developing countries on, on how, to, uh, how we get to net zero and there are always this issue of uh, combined but differentiated responsibilities, the CBDR, where developed countries have always said that the developing countries have argued that uh, 
they have been historically and currently they are lower emitters uh, they so, so therefore the responsibilities on them should should be uh, correspondingly lesser and that debate continues uh, and i have no doubt it will go into glasgow um, in november as well uh, in malaysia we have of course uh, phrased it very tactfully our our ndc where the main main um, and the main showcase piece is of course the uh, the, we have agreed to reduce the intensity from um, uh, of emissions by four, uh, by forty five percent. So that's that's a ten percent increase in our uh, in our ambition. But uh, again, as I say, compared to the level of uh, uh, fossil fuel exposure that we have in in Malaysia, that's that's uh, that's certainly not enough. Um, as you know. The UN's figures are is that Malaysia's energy is 96 percent, 96 point, and a bit higher uh, fossil fuels. Um, and earlier, uh, uh, late last year, we we published a report. So UNDP does this human development report every year, which is a data heavy uh, league table of uh, how countries rank on the uh, human development index. And the Human Development Index is a composite of uh, uh, income indicators, health indicators, educational achievement indicators, etc. It's a composite index. This year, uh, for the last year, for last year's report, we played around a little and we layered on a planetary pressure index, uh, a planetary pressure parameter to this index, and made it a little more complex. And then saw how countries' rankings changed, and two stark things stood out. One um almost no country in the world has had uh, a growth pattern that is planetary neutral there has been some impact on the planet and that that's 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 sobering in our region uh, the the shifts were quite dramatic singapore fell by 82 ranks uh, once you once you uh, layered on a planetary filter onto the overall human development index. Malaysia also fell, not, not, not quite as much. Uh, Malaysia fell by about 18 ranks. Um, sorry, Singapore fell by 92 ranks. So that's uh, so that just shows that our part of the world, while it's uh, mega biodiverse uh, and, 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 and very, very uh, uh, planetarily important, it's also our exposure to fossil fuels is, is very, very, very heavy. Now let me maybe zoom in on two more things before I before I wrap up. One is your your role as the uh, as as the MOGSI, the working group, as well as you know, the bigger role of the oil and gas sector. Uh, I mean, first, there's no full full acknowledgement to the to the revenue you contribute to to Malaysia. I think it's uh, my colleagues were telling me um, that the combined revenues over the last five years. Uh, we're in the range of, let me see, 125 trillion ringgit Malaysia. And I'm doing a very quick math. Um, my colleagues have uh, sort of explained to me year by year revenues. And uh, so 54 ring, uh, billion ringgit in 2018, 24 billion ringgit in 2019, 34 in 2020, and 25 uh, so far this year. So that's that's so impressive. Uh, which also means that you have you have a strong lever to make change, um, and as I said at the beginning, not not just change in your industry, but building back, uh, contributing to a building back better trajectory. So uh, your sort of greater citizenship role is is absolutely key. Um, a few thoughts, uh, maybe. Uh, to to share with you that has been going through our minds that uh, maybe we could uh, think of for, uh, for for more deep con deeper con conversations. Uh, first is the building of strategies for low carbon business models uh, that minimize carbon use, um, and 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 not just build the strategies but also articulate them well. So so public perception is. Uh, is with you is that this this work is happening 
second, the development of ESG metrics. I mean, we're all talking ESG in, um, uh, you know, ideally I would plead that you go beyond ESG and corporate social responsibility and actually take charge of, 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 of building the new agenda. But look, even if ESG metrics could be um, worked on to be more transparent, objective, and more accessible to investors. Uh, third, uh, embrace net zero seriously. I would say uh, net zero and circular economy are perhaps the two two concepts that, if when unpacked properly, are showing the most promise uh, for for uh, you know the, our commitments to the Paris Agreement. Uh, I, I, and I'm not putting all of this on you, colleagues. It's uh, there's. Uh, I know the world also needs to help you out, in the sense that, for example, technology is is a big area where, uh, and ecosystem factors, which which you need to be helped with. Uh, I was just reading um, the research by Bill Gates in his uh, in his book, uh, How to Avoid the Climate Disaster. And he talks about this uh, power density issue, for example, uh, which which shows the efficiencies of different sources of power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, land use, uh, power and energy, vis-a-vis -vis land use and resource use. And look, fossil fuels are by far the more efficient right now. Uh, if uh, it's how many watts per square meter of space uh, do you generate? Any, anywhere between 500 to 10,000. Uh, most other nuclear comes close, but uh, solar is, solar generates five to twenty uh, per square meter. So there you are. I mean, it, we have to find the technologies to make solar far more space intensive. Uh, space meaning uh, literally geographical space. Uh, uh, and until we do that, you know, it's it's uh, there are all these constraints to developing uh, renewables, which. Uh, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but there's work to be done. There's work to be done. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's, you know, we, this whole sort of all of society approach is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, fourth, um, carbon markets and play in them, uh, work with them, uh, encourage their growth and, uh, and um, again, uh, embrace them and help, help develop them. Um, and finally, uh, work on your own workforce strategy, and we talked about this when, when we met earlier this year, uh, that makes it uh, your workforce strategy should, should, uh, could address issues of uh, uh, talent attraction, which, uh, uh, which, you know, good talent will naturally translate into more uh, planet-friendly socially friendly, governance friendly strategies. Uh, colleagues, finally, I'll, I'll just end a little bit with what uh, UNDP is up to. Um, as you know, we have, um, uh, unlike our sister agencies, all of who have sectoral mandates, like UNICEF works on, children, um, on children's issues, UNESCO on culture and education. UNDP is the, uh, is the agency tasked with working across the mandates. Uh, recognizing, of course, that while all of these uh, sectors deserve attention, deep dive attention on their own, there is also an interoperability. The, the, there's an impact of energy on women. There's an impact of women, uh, women's education on health, etc. So that's why there's this agency which kind of works at the cusp of all the SDGs. Uh, so it's sometimes hard for us to describe in an elevator pitch, what do you do? <laughs> but uh, and you you will understand that we really work at the trade-offs between between the different goals. Um, so we're working really with uh, across three pillars. One is the governance pillar, working to strengthen institutions and governance um, uh, capacity uh, development. We work on policy and uh, le uh, legal and regulatory framework for sure. Uh, we provide uh, technical expertise on data uh, baselining. Uh, assessment, measuring SDG progress, uh, and of course, uh, increasingly we are more uh, working more and more through broad-based partnerships um, and trying to leverage uh, more energy, cross-sector energy between um, uh, financing 
uh, across financing and, and uh, carbon, low carbon solutions, etc. So colleagues, in closing, I'd like to urge uh, all of you to join hands with us and go beyond CSR, go beyond um, ESG and take charge of, of uh, building back better. Uh, and once more, thank you, Moxi, for, for giving me this opportunity to come and um, hang out with you. Uh, over to you, Farhan. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Niloy. Um, all right, Mr. Niloy, probably I have one more, uh, one question, yeah, um, I think posted by the participants here. Um, all right, for, for a more ambitious NDCs for Malaysia, what are, the, what are the key priorities that UNDP sees as immediate opportunities for the country and for the oil and gas value change? I mean, look, renewables is the obvious cop-out answer, but uh, uh, but I, I really think you're you're uh, hitting the nail on the head uh, by talking about your supply chains. Uh, your 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 supply chains are complex, and your uh, and your uh, uh, there are very large number of players in your supply chain if you if you manage your supply chains on the at the at the one end at, and if you manage i mean it, it requires investment uh, we we do uh, not in this in this particular field we do a set of trainings with uh, uh, major corporations uh, like johnson and johnson maxis uh, on their supply chains but that's more related to corruption etc uh, issues not exactly this but just to exemplify, and um, it takes very intense uh, engagement with the SMEs and others who, who sit in their supply chains. So there's an investment to be made there, and I think that's where one uh, one area where our NDC goals can, can go up. On the other, on the other hand, uh, I think uh, MOGSI, uh, UNDP, and others, we really need to talk to the government about uh, pivoting policy towards uh, renewables. I mean, we come on, energy transformation don't happen until you have uh, until you have right incentives, and it's not just the regulatory framework. There has yes, to be incentives, right. tax breaks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, maybe those two, I would I would leave it at that, and maybe colleagues after me will will pick up on those topics. All right, thank you, thank you, Ms. Anila, thank you so much. All right, Petronas has announced its aspiration to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2050 as part of its holistic approach to sustainability that balances ESG consideration, which are aligned to its statement of purpose, namely to be a progressive energy and solution partner and reaching, light, and reaching lives for a sustainable future. Our first guest speaker, Ms. Charlotte Wolfby, Chief Sustainability Officer of Petronas. Previously, Charlotte worked for the Norwegian energy company Equino in the role of Vice President Sustainability. She delivered the company's first sustainability strategy that laid the foundation for the company's low carbon focus. She was also Equino representative on the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative and the World Bank's Global Gas Flaring Reduction Initiative. Charlotte is a long-standing and active champion of corporate sustainability practices. She is the recipient of Leadership Award by DIVAX for her contribution to international development. Currently, she serves on the Board of Trustees of the UN Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Centre, Cambridge United Kingdom. With the topic Sustainability, a key enabler for value creation at Petronas, please join me to welcome Ms. Charlotte. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Farah, and, and well done on your excellent moderation so far of this very important event. Um, I, I liked the, I thought it was a poem at the beginning. I, I couldn't believe it was a Michael Jackson song. Very, very poignant. Thank you. Uh, but I also like to uh, extend my congratulations to Moxie for embracing sustainable, sustainable development. Uh, the whole agenda with such rigor and gusto. Um, and also I would like to congratulate Mr. Banerjee because you laid out the context both comprehensively but also in a targeted way um, because as an industry we affect so many of the SDGs and we have to make sure that we it's not just about doing things on the side but tailoring our operations to strengthen sustainable development. Now I, I will try to dovetail my remarks to yours as much as possible let's see how, how we how I can get along here but also I want to 
uh, express, express my pleasure to be among such uh, prominent speakers today and, and also Malaysia's oil and gas fraternity. So thank you for having me. Now, as you heard, I'm relatively new to Petrona, so my remarks will um, start out with more sort of an outside-in international perspective, if you don't mind. First, really, I want to start by saying that the past 18 months really has changed everything. The world we left behind before COVID-19 is so different from today and the future ahead. I mean, can we actually remember what December 1919, uh, 2019 looked like? It was a very different world. So right now we're quite and rightly concerned about global health and the economic effects of over 4 billion people moving in and out of lockdown. It really is astonishing kind of in the situation that we're in. Now, we also come to realize just how vulnerable we are to systemic risks, of which climate change, of course, is one of the most important ones. But it's not the only risk. And only a couple of days ago, I was listening to a, a colleague of Mr. Banerjee, um, uh, Mrs. Ingrid Anderson. She's the executive director of the United Nations Environment Programme. And she highlighted that we're actually facing three crises, all relating to sustainable development namely climate crisis, nature crisis, and the crisis of inequality. And I think these were all the points that also Mr. Banerjee just mentioned. So the topics and of, of, of this seminar here today is, is really relevant around sustainable development in the oil and gas sector and the way forward, because we do need to move forward. It's all about resilience in this new context. And in my remarks, I will reflect on the current context, value creation, and on Petronas. And I also have some asks on you, as you are partners in our value chain. So starting out with the context. Now, I'd argue that the energy transition has become central to policymakers, investors, and us oil and gas players. So let me elaborate on policy. As we heard from Mr. Banerjee, we We've seen many economic recovery packages across the world to include a strong component of green growth. So we have, for instance, the European Green uh, Deal, which is a, a trillion euro uh, package over 10 years. We have the EU Just Transition Mechanism of 100 billion euros. And we have France, South Korea, India, China, all looking uh, a sort of pledged um, and I think also working very effectively on a sort of green, building back better, a greener, better future after the COVID. Uh, but also we've seen in Malaysia that um, I think it was in April in Malaysia, we agreed a green recovery plan and we also have a stronger commitment for renewable energy and also confirmed the intention not to renew coal power purchase agreements from 2033. And we're seeing new regulations internationally as well to drive decarbonisation. But as we know, and as Mr. Manager also talked about, these types of commitments don't come a moment too soon. So early August, we had the International um, Panel for uh, Climate Change, um, the uh, sixth assessment report, um, and it talked about really the state of, of the climate. And I wanted to just dive in into that a little bit because we must take note. Temperature is likely to rise by more than two degrees within the next two decades, this report said. But since then, actually, we had the International Meteorological Organization come up with a report saying that we're probably going to go beyond 1.5 degrees in the next five years. This is really imminent. And even if emissions would be curbed today, temperatures will continue to rise at least to 2050. Now, does that matter? Yes, it does, because for every additional degree of warming, this IPCC report talks about rainfall and intensifying by 7%. Sea alert level rises of up to two meters can't be ruled out. And the closer we stay to maximum warming of 1.5 degree, the more desirable the climate will be to live in. However, we also know from other United Nations reports that a so-called green recovery that Mr. Banerjee talks so eloquently about really could change the course and cut the emissions by 25%. But the only way to curb the current rate of global warming is twofold. One, drastically reduce carbon emissions, and two, halt deforestation. And that means really today. So that's on the policy. What about investors? 
So investors are more and more concerned about how climate change and other sustainability issues affect company risk and the underlying risk to their investments. Investors are incorporating what we already had mentioned, ESG, so the, the environment, social and governance uh, criteria into company evaluations. Now, I go so far as to say that this is game changing. It's not just about the environment, how companies address biodiversity and social equity is equally important and also evaluated by the investor community. And, and this is also the three crises that we heard Inga Andersen from UNEP mention uh, earlier this week. Now, by 2022, so by next year, which is kind of tomorrow almost, it's, we're almost there, we're expecting that around three quarters of European institutional investors will make ESG a default position. We're now seeing an exponential transfer of monies into ESG. In five of the world's top financial markets, um, there were already last year $35 trillion invested in ESG assets, and that equals around 36% of all assets under management. And during this year, these investments have continued to grow really rapidly. Whilst all this transfer of, of money into ESG is happening, there's also a permanent transfer of funds out of oil and gas. And this really changes a lot. In practice, this means for our industry that financial resilience is evaluated based on climate change risk and transition risk. And this transition risk stemming from societal pressures, technological disruption, or shifting consumer preferences. And this really matters to the oil and gas sector. And let me explain. I want to give you a couple of more examples. The, our sector actually is lagging in performance uh, against the Standard & Poor's 500. Um, a snapshot from February this year shows that companies like big companies like BP, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, Shell have seen their combined capitalization shrink by 40%. Whilst we've seen investors in, in low carbon energy sectors where companies actually their value has gone up by over 200%. That means that if you would have invested in, in oil and gas shares 15 years ago, you would have actually earned seven percentage points less than if you would have invested into um, the S&P 500. So this really drives investors to call for greater transparency into emission performance across entire value chains, which we sit in. And our sector is the main target. They really want to understand that is this a sector that they can invest in with good returns. So how are companies responding in our sector to this? Um, we see examples where companies are even implying a change in their business models. We see Shell pledging to become the world's biggest utility company. We have um, Occidental in the US that's turning itself from an oil and gas producer to a carbon capture and services company. And Equinor, where I used to work, is, is making really big bets on offshore wind. And but I, I'm mentioning all of this to you because even if you're not a listed company, this matters. It's about access to capital at affordable rates. It's about financing, for instance, your expansion or your future projects. It's about finding partners and partners who are willing to partner with you. It's also about retaining Malaysia's export markets. Between 60 and 70% of all the export revenue um, in Malaysia it actually comes from countries that have pledged to go net zero. And that means that their value chains should also aim for net zero. And the European Union is going even further and has tabled legislation around carbon border adjustments that would come into force in 2023. So this is all happening and it's real. So give me this yeah. Michelle, sorry, um, I apologize. Uh, did you share your video screen? Because we are actually seeing a black it's yeah so we are oh. not yeah. I do beg your pardon um, I'm very sorry about this um, no problem I I am um, technically I sure. exit spotlight and you can spotlight on me again perhaps all right um, yes let, let's let's try
uh, can you probably try to off the camera and uh, start the game? Probably? So um, I'll, I'll dial back in, OK? Yep. If you can sure. let me back in. Now, Farah, is this working? Um, yes, it works perfect now. <laughs> so Technical, embarrassing. yeah. Technical. I, I did have a frozen screen on Mr. Banerjee on my screen, I must admit. So uh, apologies for, for the technical challenges here. No problem, no problem. So um, now you get to see my face as well. I do exist. Yeah. Uh, it's not a recording. <laughs> yeah. So what I wanted to say, if I may just quickly continue, so uh, in Malaysia, export revenues really uh, uh, obviously matter and about 70% um, of the export revenues uh, to Malaysia come from countries that have pledged net zero. And I just wanted to ask again, am I still on the screen, Farah, just because uh, I've got a black screen now, apologies. Yes, yes, okay. you are still on the screen. <laughs> okay, good, good, I'm going to check now. So, um, all right, so in this whole new context with policy, investor evaluations and business models, so how do we ensure sustainable value creation? And in Petronas, we acknowledge the energy transition and we made a clear strategic intent by announcing our net zero carbon emission aspiration by 2050, as you heard mentioned earlier in, in the introductions. And our aim is to provide cleaner energy and solutions that benefit both the world at large as well as the customers we serve. And this net zero carbon aspiration forms part of a holistic approach to sustainability. And we, we sort of apply four lenses to how we approach our operations in general. So it's continued value creation, safeguarding the environment, positive social impact and responsible governance. So the ethos is really about making a positive change and not only to ride the energy uh, transition, but a fundamental shift here is needed and old practices won't create sustainability, sustainable value. We know that. So what do we need to do to achieve our net zero ambition and sustainable value creation? First, we must ensure that our core oil and gas business is resilient, both to lower commodity prices and higher carbon prices. So let me back this up with some figures. Um, there was a, a scenario issued by management consultancy McKinsey, and they estimated that by glo um, that globally by 2030, only 25 to 35 percent of shallow water crude production is viable with a carbon price of up to $100 a ton. Let me tell you, there are already markets where you have a carbon price above $100 a ton. For deep water, ultra deep water and unconventional resources, this share drops down to less than 5%. This is only a scenario, nonetheless a potential future to be prepared for. So that means that any strategy must deliver the optimal combination of low break-even prices and low emission intensity. As I mentioned before, investors are now evaluating risks and returns under different commodity and carbon price scenarios. So oil and gas companies will need to become experts in carbon management and really be open and transparent about emissions. This is important 
because it's important for us to retain access to capital at favorable rates and really to be part of whole the solution going forward. So at operational terms, we require action at all levels, and this includes driving down costs, improving energy efficiency, reducing flaring, venting, and as we heard from Mr. Banerjee, methane emissions, electrifying gas turbines, and so on. And for all of that, we need your support, of course. Now, lowering the uh, carbon emissions from our own operations won't suffice when, as we all know, um, three quarters of all emissions stem from the use of oil and gas products by the end consumer. And that's why any comprehensive strategy must encompass investments in renewable energy, low carbon solutions such as hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, and, and that must be on an industrial scale. Uh, but we also need to develop nature-based carbon solutions, or so-called forest offsets. And of course, Malaysia has great potential in this field. So all of these markets have come with great potential. And we also know that standing still is not a winning strategy. So how is Petronas preparing to sort of to change and to serve a low carbon world? So we really um, recognize our role in providing access to affordable energy, energy security, and providing sustainable solutions that ultimately benefit society. And, and these are not just statements or hollow words. It, it signals our expansion into a portfolio beyond oil and gas, well into the broader energy space. And this, of course, is the right direction. Now, we see opportunity in this transition, and we are steadfast focused on delivering profit with purpose. So in our company, this means roughly about five things. Translating net zero goals into action, and you will all be a very part of, a important part of all of that. Two, we need to look at obstacles and ways to get past them. That could be policy obstacles, for instance. We need to mobilize resources, and four, deploy new technologies, and five, really need, need to enter into new partnerships. And this process has already started. We're now developing low-cost, low-emission solutions. Uh, for instance, we already have a portfolio of renewable energy capacity, and we have started to look at carbon capture and storage at the Kazawari phase two. Now, we must get better at what we already do and forge new capabilities, leadership, and cultures to enable this new growth. And in Petronas, we have many initiatives that are designed to do exactly that. And the focus for us is to make technology our differentiator, digitalization our accelerator, and data as our core asset. So we have a lot of what it takes. And, and we also believe that our oil and gas expertise can be leveraged. And briefly, I know I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to mention an example, which could be relevant for you from my time working at Equinor. So what we did in Equinor is that we brought our supplier community together and rather than saying to them, give us a 10% reduction in emission, maybe in this process or that process, we got them together and we started out by saying, what would a zero emission platform look like? And when you start the discussion from zero, you get a very different solution in place. And needless to say that the supplier industry now on the Norwegian continental shelf have become world leading, not just in carbon capture and storage, but also in offshore wind. So it really uh, merits to work together. So my final remarks, I just want to say that the energy transition won't go away. We must all embrace the challenge, but we must need to, to work together like we never worked before. And I'm certain that we would be able to forge a common vision for our industry and one that will focus on delivering a net zero Malaysian oil and gas value chain. And, and this value chain really should deliver sustainable development, competitiveness for our sector and resilient and start a new chapter of prosperity for Malaysia. And finally, finally, Farah, I just wanted to say that I think that now is the most exciting time to work in this industry and we're so fortunate to be in it. So thank you very much and apologies for the technical challenges. No problem. All right. Thank you, Ms. Charlotte, for the wonderful sharing that are important to our members here. So I probably will take uh, one question here from uh, the participants. Yeah. All right. As you mentioned about the renewable energy being critical to managing risk to climate crisis, you also touch about the investment required and partnering as possible business model 
given the high investment required, do you view that this may necessitate nationalizations of energy sector as the private sectors may have limitation on the effort? Very good um, question that could merit a very long answer. And I'm not sure if I have the full answer, but I would say no. I, I do believe that we need to work in partnership because everybody has a role to play. We need government to be part of the solution. We also need a private sector to be part of the solution. But we do need to have a common vision and, and a line of sight where we're all heading. And that way we can actually, our investments will build on each other's investments. Uh, and, and that will make all the difference. It's actually, uh, I think, about go all going in the same direction. That's absolutely critical. So we do need to partner and talk and engage like we've never done before. All right. I think if when it comes to Petronas, right, we always have more than one question. <laughs> so probably I will just take another one because we uh, we still have uh, time. So um, um, investors tend their concern on sustainability. Petronas has the policy on sustainability net zero. How Petronas drive downstream, especially vendors in tier two and tier three on sustainable sustainability? So I'm sure there's a lot lots going on already, and I must admit that um, I, I don't know everything that's going on. I have very capable and competent colleagues who've been working on this for a long, long time. Actually, Petronas has, has been devoted to sustainable development agenda for, for 20 years or so. Yeah. Going forward, however, we do need to um, accelerate and scale up our engagement at, because we need to focus on delivery. Now it's about rubber hitting the road. So um, I, I would say we've already started working with some of our partners in looking at um, kind of our framework agreement and actually looking at where can we where can we infuse it with this whole net zero thinking and make sure that our objectives are aligned with reducing emissions and, and creating new type of value. So that's already happening, but I could see a lot more of this happening and, and there will be more coming out also from Petronas on this, for sure. But, but not quite tomorrow, just give us a little bit of time. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Charlotte, for your wonderful sharing once again. So before we take our um, economic break, I would like to invite our distinguished speakers and all participants for a group photo session. Please turn on your video. Can we have you guys to turn on the video? All right, um, Raimi, uh, can you help me? Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I think there's more coming in. I didn't see Puan Sharifa. <laughs> oh, probably it's only my screen, is it? Is Puan Sharifa there? Okay, are we ready? Right. Uh, just check the full screen. We need our cameraman. <laughs> Can we have one? Let me. Or maybe. 
Let me let me check. Yeah. Uh, wait, my screen blue. Or probably we have a network challenge this morning. <laughs> You get one. All right, I just uh, get the together mode. All right. All right, ready everyone? Smile, one, two, three. One more. One with the thumbs up. <laughs> Thumbs up. One, two, three. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, all right, guys, we're going to have our 10 minute economic break and we will be back at 1120. Want an easier way to manage your company's travel bookings? Introducing MH BizPro, a self-managed portal by Malaysia Airlines that allows you to keep track of your company's travel bookings and earn rewards. MH BizPro simplifies and enhances your business travel experience by offering benefits such as free sign-up, no subscription or registration fee is required for MH BizPro. Preferential fares. Save more with attractive corporate fares when you book your flight with MH BizPro. Manage travel booking flow. Enjoy a smoother booking experience as MH BizPro allows you to design an easy approval flow for all your employees. Optimize travel expense. Based on your company's travel budget, you can monitor your spend and even generate reports from the portal. The best part? Your company will also get to enjoy rewards with MH BizPro. In fact, the more you fly, the more rewards you will enjoy. So, how do you sign up? Easy. Just log on to mhbizpro.malaysiaairlines.com to create an MH BizPro account. Sign up now and enjoy a simpler way to manage your business travels today. When going on a trip, the first thing you'll need to do is check in online before leaving home. Remember to pack your hand sanitizer, passport and face masks. You'll need to arrive at least four hours prior to departure. And don't forget to wear a face mask. Make sure you pack enough for your trip. Next, walk through thermal scanners to get your temperature checked. Airport surfaces are clean and sanitized regularly. Follow the instructions and print your baggage tag. Head to the baggage drop-off counter to verify your passport and drop your baggage. Reveal your face for passport verification. Reveal your face to the camera at immigration. There will be no body contact during screening, just the use of handheld screening devices. Face masks 
must always be worn in the Golden Lounge. Get your temperature checked. Scan the QR code for contactless registration. Sanitize your hands. To order food, just scan the QR code and make an order. For drinks, head to the beverage counter to make an order. Collect your meal when it's ready. For reading material, sign into the Wi-Fi and you may download the Going Places magazine and the Temptations duty-free catalog as no physical reading material will be made available. Social distancing will also be maintained in the Golden Lounge. Do arrive at least one hour prior to departure at the boarding gate. Go through security screening. Present your documents for verification and get your temperature checked before entering. Present your passport and scan your boarding pass. Cabin crew are dressed in safety gear and ready to serve you. In-flight magazines have been removed for safety reasons. For your safety, our aircraft are installed with HEPA filters, which trap 99.97% of dust particles, airborne viruses and bacteria. Do wear your mask at all times during the flight except when you need to eat or drink. Meals are pre-packed for easy and hygienic consumption. The lavatories are periodically cleaned. Aircraft are disinfected after every flight. When arriving in KLIA, you will be required to fill a health declaration form. Sanitize your hands upon disembarking. Walk through thermal scanners to check your temperature. Then, reveal your face for passport verification. Collect your sanitized baggage and you're done! Want an easier way to manage your company's travel bookings? Introducing MH Biz Pro self-managed portal by Malaysia Airlines that allows you to keep track of your company's travel bookings and earn rewards. MH BizPro simplifies and enhances your business travel experience by offering benefits such as free sign-up, no subscription or registration fee is required for MH BizPro. Preferential fares, save more with attractive corporate fares when you book your flight with MH BizPro. Manage travel booking flow. Enjoy a smoother booking experience as MH BizPro allows you to design an easy approval flow for all your employees. Optimize travel expense. Based on your company's travel budget, All right, welcome back. Welcome back, guys. All right. In recent years, as business navigate through changes brought in by globalization, technology, society and consumer behavior, embedding ESG factors into the core strategy can help deliver long term value. Our next speaker, a very well known icon in the industry, Encik Rohaizat Darus. A bit background of him, Encik Rohaizat is the president of Velisto Energy Berhad since January 2012. An engineer by training, he has worked with both local and multinational companies in a career spanning more than 30 years. This include Petronas, Sapura Kenchana, Texas Instruments, and ASO Production Malaysia. And Chet Roizat experience covers most aspects of upstream activities. On the corporate side, his experience include managing initial public offerings, right issue, syndicate loans, and corporate restructuring, including the merger and capital reduction exercise. He also an advisor to the Malaysian Oil and Gas Service Council, member of Industry Advisory Panel of MPRC, besides being adjunct professor at University Technology Petronas. 
with the topic balancing ESG purpose and business performance. Please join me welcome Encik Roizat Darus. Over to you. Uh, thank you Farah. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for spending your time this morning to come to this, join us in this forum as well as to uh, listen to what we have on a new topic and a hot topic in town which will be here for a long time which is sustainability and ESG. Uh, for this morning, I would like to share our journey in sustainability uh, as well as to emphasis on certain areas that we can share in terms of implementing ESG in our company. As you are aware, Bellesto has started our journey quite some time ago and we are happy to note that currently we are listed under Bursa Malaysia FTSE for Good uh, Index as well as uh, classified as Tier 1, which is setting the pace for sustainability ESG. So with that, I would like to just start. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, on, on when you look at the left bottom left hand side yeah, of the uh, presentation here, you can see in recent years there are more floods and landslides all over the world, not only in tropical countries, but also in the temperate countries in Europe like Germany as well. On the other hand, we also see droughts and famine in other parts of the world, especially in the third world countries. We also see poverty and uh, <coughs> hunger all over the world, especially in African countries. So what are these events having to do with Petronas to get net, gold, net carbon zero in 2050? Uh, the banks globally looking into sustainability SG more seriously, and also more women in business, business slavery and so on. All these are intertwined together on how we as human beings manage our environment, manage the world. We have been uh, neglecting uh, our environment. We have not been very fair to everybody in the world. Some people are very rich, some people are very poor. We are not very fair to certain uh, uh, type of people. So therefore, we need to embrace sustainability and ESG to ensure that we go back to basic, we go back to a fair world, a world that is good to be living now as well, good to be left behind for our grandchildren, for our great great grandchildren. So we can start our sustainability journey by looking at United Nations Sustainability Development Goal, the 17 UN SDG, which I think most of us have heard about it. But most of the time, sustainability and ESG is equated to global warming and climate changes only. Actually, ESG covers more than just climate change. Yeah. Climate, but at the same time, climate agenda impact other non-environmental goals too. Yeah. For example, with climate change, we have flood and droughts. Yeah. And then we have uh, famine, which lead to poverty and hunger, which is a threat to UNSDG 1, no poverty, and UNSDG 2, zero hunger. Next, please. So, the whole topic today is actually to balance ESG purpose and business performance. But before that, I would like to highlight first for people who are not very familiar with ESG, why we have to be so hung up and so gung-ho about ESG. First of all, we need to see from here, clients are driving ESG more. You heard, you heard just now that Petronas are going net zero carbon in 2050. So because of that, a lot of contracts have emission control, preventing the pollution, and also all other human rights as well as gender equality and so on. That's required by cl most clients in order for us to move forward. At the same time, market threat, our product, our services may be suffering if we are not embracing ESG properly. There are green tax which provide incentive for people who go towards ESG. There are also penalties for people who are not embracing ESGs. So then we have to make sure that we are in compliance with human rights, with no business slavery and other things that will bring us closer to compliance and embracing of USG. On the other hand, also we have regulatory compliance. The Paris Agreement is being adopted by most countries in the world. And in November, in Glasgow, you're going to see COP26, which will come up with a lot of resolution. Like Mr. Niloy said just now, our track record with regards to ESG is very depressing in terms of globally. So we are below our target. So I, I believe 
COP26 may introduce a lot of new regulations and rules to be implemented by governments across the world to improve and expedite compliance to ESG and make us a better world. And on the other side also from the company standpoint, we must remember any companies need financial support. Sometimes we have to go for loans, sometimes we need to get uh, shareholders and so on. So there is a task force on climate related financial disclosure, TCFD, who are looking at all these disclosures by companies and giving guidelines on how much disclosures need to be given by financial institution, by investment uh, 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 in entities, as well by insurance companies and so on. So many banks use these guidelines to evaluate how to give loan and how to invest. So if we are not such going for sustainability, then our chances of getting financial facilities will be impacted. And if even we do get, maybe the cost of these facilities or this loan is going to be higher. So with ESG, we are moving closer to, to sustainability. Yeah. This will lead to a better world and a business environment for, every, for all of us, a better business environment, which is what all we want. Next, please. So, the issue is that how to embrace the SG? To embrace the SG needs money, time, and efforts. And how to balance this? Well, we also need to improve our business performance or even to survive in this current situation. Some of us are barely surviving. But actually, if you look into the detail, which I will present shortly, we can actually do this together because ESG and business performance can go together. Like for we can see from here, an environmental requirement of initiative for ESG. We already have health safety environment, which is very important for our business. On the social side, we need to take care of our people. We need to take care of people around us. We need to take care of the people who supported us in our business. It's already there. In governance, companies need to be compliant to regulation. Companies need to ensure that we have a business process to ensure that we, we can run our business efficiently. So it's already there. So what I'm trying to say is that while we say balancing, but actually a lot of things is already there, which we can improve further to improve our compliance to ESG and eventually improve our rating for sustainability. This is not that difficult. Yeah. So when we look into more detail, yeah? let's look into more detail. For example, for an environment, yeah? in any business, emission control is very important. Otherwise, the DOE will be after you. In order for us to, to do our, our business, we may improve our emission control system. For example, if we use a lot of machinery, we may want to, to have a special or, or a, a typical power control system so that the engines can only produce power that we need only and stop and stop and stop and uh, start the other engine whenever there's additional power required by having that we are helping on the sdg number three good health and well-being as well as climate climate action because there's less greenhouse gas is being 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 being, uh, being uh, released to atmosphere at the same time we use less fuel so, and on, on energy consumption, yeah, for us, we can look into work from home. A lot of us has been working from home for quite some time. So why not we continue further? Yeah. So we, we can continue further to work from home further by maybe 50-50 or maybe by 60-40, we able whichever is suitable for each company. With work from home, a lot of staff, let's say 50-50, half of the staff will not be driving to, to, to work or take motorcycle or, or take bus and so on. This will reduce a lot of emission and a lot of fuel that's going to be used. So we save money by not having to have spend too much money on petrol. At least half of petrol bill will be reduced by not having to go to work half of the time because we work from home. At the same time, we com contribute to reducing the emission to, 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 the, to the environment. So this one will help on energy number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. We also can minimize water, water consumption, especially for the marine industry. For us, in the marine side, our rig use filtered seawater for toilet use, for cleaning use and other things. We only use portable water from shore only for drinking purposes and for cooking purposes. So after we use it, we filter it back, then we, set, we release the clean water, the, the uh, filtered water to the sea. So therefore, 
we help to reduce pollution to the sea as well as help to reduce consumption of clean water which is becoming more and more scarce commodity nowadays and in terms of uh, to prevent from pollution yeah we need to move into systematic management of waste material so when we, we do those kind of things we can control how the waste material is being disposed of instead of being disposed of the environment we can we will do it properly dispose of the right, right place like uh, alarm, alarm flora and other proper and allowed and legal disposal facilities by doing this you let you have lesser fuel cost to the company you avoid potential penalty and reputation damage as you are if you know now penalty for pollution is very very high the senior management can be pulled to court or even go to jail if you pollute and also will will reduce energy cost both for the company and for our staff yeah by working from home and sometimes by working from home you have more productive time because the staff can avoid going to the office in the traffic jam and coming back in traffic jam two or three hours can be safe then you can get productive more productive time but same uh, quality of job that we can you can get and also when we have pollution uh, control pollution system uh, management system you eliminate costly cleanup cost and also penalties next please so on the social side yeah when you look at the social side we all already required to uh, you already required to hire people yeah we, we need to people to work for us so why not we hire more women and more minorities they are equally good compared to men and the, the mainstream so if you do that indirectly you can contribute toward UN SDG number five gender equality and reduce unequal un, inequalities by just doing what you normally do nothing extra yeah so and in terms of training a lot long-term stuff with plan you need to do training for your people to make sure that the company become more efficient so why not you develop a proper program for skill development and also educational engagement engage with university get the, the students to, to to come to you do the internship or train some of the students at high school with special skill to study mathematics english and so on and track them later on maybe five years from them then they can come and join your company so by, by that thing, you provide quality education. And if the student from four people, you also help to UN SDG number one, which is to reduce poverty. Yeah. And on the health and safety also, I think similar approach that we need to look into. This is the easiest one to follow, actually. Oil and gas company are actually required to have a high safe, safety, health and environmental compliance. We already have that. So why not? We ensure that we, we we enhance that, yeah. Not only in terms of uh, physical health, but also mental health. So then we contribute toward good health and well-being. We end SG number three. It's already there. Also on the corporate social responsibility, I believe that everybody do this corporate social responsibility as part of your day-to-day -day or as part of your overall uh, strategy of the company. So when we engage community engagement program, for us we look into three items. Yeah, for the environment, we look into uh, cleaning up the beach. We look into planting more trees, and for social, we look into education. Like I mentioned, we give training uh, to students who's taking SPM. We engage university. Yeah, we give talk to universities. Then we also have best two instead drilling academy where we train people to be good at uh, drilling. At the same time, we also have. Uh, the, the the program for the governance yeah so we we train people on how to comply with the new regulation and so on so we comply with all number three good health and uh, well, uh, well-being number four quality education and number 14 life below water so what is the benefit to the company it's very simple where you have mixed group of people in your team women minorities men and so on you can have multiple perspectives and you cover all angles in your decision making. And also, when you put good training for your staff and for the people that is going to go into workforce, you actually provide better skill, not only for your company, but also for other, other companies. If those people from the school and university don't join you, but at least they join other companies, they, they'll be better and their family will be better. Yeah? And also, 
in, in, uh, we need to have a pipeline for future staffing requirement. So if you have a proper program, most of the people you, you, you help and train before will be joining the company because they like your company. Next, please. Then we look at governance. This is very important. Yeah. So we need to have effective and reliable process. So we have to have a proper management procedures, which can be an initiative. So with proper management system procedures, everybody do know what to do. Everybody know uh, how to do the work efficiently and do this will minimize errors. We will end up with lower cost and more profit. At the same time, you comply with UNSDG number 16, which justice and strong institution. You also need to comply with regulation as part of your business requirement. You don't want your company to be compounded or worse still your management to have to go to court and go to jail because you don't comply with certain things. So we can conduct compliance enforcement awareness program, both for the company or for the industry, as well for the, out, the everybody out there on how or what to do and what not to do, especially in industry like us, where it's highly regulated. We are regulated by Petronas, we are regulated by DOE, we are regulated by customs and all sorts of things. So by having ESG initiative to enhance compliance awareness is going to help everybody. And also, as a company also, we must understand in the whole world, they are also bad hats. They are also naughty people from time to time. That will abuse, we heard from the newspaper from time to time, that they engage in corrupt practice, they engage in uh, stealing money from the company, yeah, CBT, yeah, uh, breach of trust, criminal breach of trust. So we can have ESG initiative to, edu to, to give education to these people and to give awareness to these people that what you do is not good. You can end up in jail, you can be penalized, you can be sacked and all sorts of things. And this also help to enhance the governance, not only the company, but also to their family. So they can go back and talk to the children. This is not something that shouldn't be done and so on. Yeah. So we, this in, indirectly also can help the company comply with Section 17A of Companies Act. I think you're aware that any corruption, even though it's done by the low level, the junior staff can impact the senior management and can cause the senior management and the board to go to court or even to jail. If you, can, you cannot prove that you have proper procedures, you have proper uh, regulation and proper, proper education to prevent people from committing corrupt act as well as bribery. So by doing this, you also have improved your ESG initiative in terms of governance, but also protect the company, protect senior management, protect the board. Yeah. So in, 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 in conclusion, yeah. next please. So in conclusion, what we can do is actually concentrating. First, further enhance existing practice to be in line with ESG and sustainability development goal. So we're already doing that today, so we improve on it to make it better and align with the sustainability development goal. The second, we need to identify low cost ESG initiative that can contribute to business requirement and performance. We identify new ESG initiative that help the company to comply with our business requirement that we have to comply anyway, comply with the standards that have been set for our business. It's part of the business. So it's not uh, it's detrimental or anything. It's actually enhancing the business. And of course, when you do it, you need to ensure the ESG initiative is done in a smaller and affordable size. Don't think about too big. Yeah, We can set the goals that is actually achievable. Yeah, Don't buy more than you can chew. And you need to implement that in stages. We, we do this one first. Maybe next year we do another one. And next year we do another one. And in the end, of the long target, we'll be very successful. And last one is actually, we must focus on the areas that give maximum benefit to the company. There's a lot of ways to enhance your ESG. Choose the thing that will give maximum benefit, not only to the community, not only to the environment, but also to the company business. Prioritization is very important. And lastly, what is very important is sincerity. It must come from the heart. Ask your heart first whether you really want to do it or not. If you really want to do it, then you can check your mind whether the company can afford to do it. 
one last last thing before I stop. You look at simple example. If you have a local supplier who can cost you maybe 2%, 3% higher than the foreign supplier. But if you give to the local supplier, their workers is mostly local, their bank is local, the money will be used by the people to buy the nasi lemak from Pakcik Ali who have five children. And the money also can be used by the staff to buy goreng pisang from Makcik Kia who have nine children. Or you want to save that 2% and give it to the foreign company where the money will be brought back to London, Paris and New York to be spent by those three investors. You answer that question and you know whether you want to go for sustainability or not. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, good that's a good point. All right. All right. Um, um, thank you, thank you Jay Jay for, for very informative, informative insight. So probably I have one question for myself, um, but uh, it's more on your personal experience. Um, I would like to know if you don't mind to share what would be your, um, with your role, what would be your challenge, you know, to maintain the ESG and, you know, balance with the business performance. Um, as well as maintain, you know, the ESG scorings, all sorts of things. If you don't mind to share, what would be the challenge and how how you you manage that, you know? I, I think when it comes to challenge, uh, uh, when you look at the uh, ESG uh, governance, social, I think there's not going to be much challenge because I think we have been already doing it. And I do believe that we can do it for the benefit of the people as well for the benefit of the company. But environment, I think, is a little bit uh, difficult, especially on the climate control. As mm -hmm. you are aware, uh, managing emission yeah, yeah. is uh, very difficult in our industry because we are considered as one of the biggest producer of polluter. And also our operation require a lot of energy. So I think this is a challenge that we need to see how we want to improve on the emission side and, and reduce the, the fuel that we use uh, at the same time not to spend too much money about it. As you are aware that it's life are very difficult for everybody in the oil and gas industry. The yeah. price are low, the job are, are hardly coming from time to time, and we are just in a survival mode, I think most yeah. of us. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, I think that's the biggest challenge, how to continue to enhance our compliance on the environmental side, mm -hmm. uh, invest more money into uh, less emission, emission uh, things and more automation while not having that much money available to move forward. That, that's the key point. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Royzat. Very informative insights. OK, um, next. Um, there is no single ESG strategy to suit every company and every investor. There is extensive scope for companies to focus on different areas across the wide ESG spectrum, depending on their market sector and their product or service or service offering and can extend beyond the primary business of the company. Our next speaker, Mr. Nick Shariza Sulaiman, he is a risk assurance partner at PwC Malaysia. He also leads the Islamic finance practice as well as the internal audit practice at PwC Malaysia. Trained in the UK as an internal auditor, he has extensive experience in operational and regulatory risk issues. Mr. Nick has more than 20 years of experience covering a wide range of engagement from strategy operation, governance and risk management within the financial service sector. He has, led, he has led a broad range of engagement across the region. This includes various due diligence reviews, assessment of ESG and Sharia principle alignment, ERM framework implementation, as well as governance and control reviews. With the topic ESG framework and governance, Please join me to welcome Mr. Nick Shariza Sulaiman from PwC Malaysia. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Farah, for the kind introduction. So just uh, to do a quick sound check, um, is, is my voice quite clear right now? Yes, perfect. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, so before I start, I just wanted to, to, to give a disclaimer that the picture that was shown earlier, that was like 10 years ago. So um, I just want to assure everyone that I'm much an older man. Uh, so I, I do have 20 years of experience, not three years. So, so anyway, um, first, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much to MOGSC for inviting me to this event. Uh, really pleased to be here. Uh, and also thank you very much for, for, for listening, for, for tuning in today. So in the next uh, 20 minutes, I will be uh, talking to you about about um, ESG framework, uh, 
what is it about, why is it important, what are the component of the framework and so on, which then tie back nicely to what uh, Jay Rahizat mentioned earlier uh, in terms of you know, the importance of ESG. Okay, if we can go to the, um, to the next slide, please. Uh, by the way, um, I, I don't have uh, that many slides, so only about 10, but what I will do is I will give some insights in terms of what are the most important components uh, of a framework. Um, so, so for this one, um, I, I think um, everyone is pretty well aware now what ESG actually means. Uh, the, the reason why I want to talk about this is some, because uh, sometimes I feel there is a bit of debate or, you know, different or in debate with regards to what's the difference between uh, ESG and sustainability. Um, so, so there is no right or wrong answer. It depends on from which perspective you are you are going you are looking at. But from from my own perspective, from what I've observed, um, the word sustainability are typically is typically used um, in the context of um, aspiration. So, for example, you want your business to be sustainable. You have a sustainable goals. Um, I think the previous speaker talked about uh, the. 17 sustainable development goals developed by United Nations. Um, so, so sustainability typically refers to that kind of context, whereas ESG, uh, people tend to use that word in the context of considerations. So, for example, you know, when institutional investors are looking at companies that they want to invest or divest, you know, they look at ESG considerations, which, you know, invariably refers to environment, social, and also governance. Um, so, ESG is a wide, is a broad range of non-financial considerations. So, so it's not just about um, protecting the environment, but it's also about, you know, having having a strong, protecting the rights of the workers, having an inclusive policy, having a strong uh, disclosure mechanism to communicate to your stakeholders and so on. So, so it's very, very broad. Yeah. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, um, so um, I, I just want to talk about uh, climate risk a bit. And the reason is because, um, well, number one, it's becoming more and more topical um, in, in conversations about ESG. And number two, I am actually personally quite frightened about it. So um, if you look at the latest IPCC report, I think that was released uh, last month, um, it, it paints a very grim uh, picture of the trajectory of carbon emission in the world. So, so just for everyone's background, uh, many countries around the world has signed uh, to, has, has basically committed to, to the Paris Accord. Uh, Malaysia is one of those countries. Generally speaking, um, you know, the, the, the objective is to half uh, the global carbon emission by 2030 and to go net zero by 2050. And then the reason uh, why these targets were designed as such is because, um, you know, um, you know, many scientists are concerned that, you know, if we don't do this on a timely basis, if we leave it too late, uh, we will get to a point of point of no return. Um, so, you know, since uh, research has, has um, uh, there have been many research been written that since the Industrial Revolution from 1800, um, the world has actually gone hotter by about one degree Celsius uh, right now. Um, another um, uh, 10 to 15 years, people expect it to be about 1.5 degrees. And, and by the end of the century, depending on, you know, the steps that we take right now, um, how, how, how you know how seriously do we take climate risk? It can go as high as three or four degrees. But you know, I just wanted to to, to give some context that an average temperature of one or two degrees doesn't mean that it is um, a flat. I mean that that number represents a mean or an average. But in terms of standard deviation, in terms of fluctuation, you know, it can go to a plus three or minus three and so on. So as a matter of fact, you know, if you look at uh, many of the climate reports that's been released during the last 12 months, you know, you've seen a lot more occurrence of heat waves, um, of floods, um, and, and also many other natural disasters uh, because of, you know, human, uh, because of human impact to, to the environment. So uh, basically what, what um, you know, I'm trying to, to, to say is that uh, climate risk is a very serious uh, issue indeed, not just globally, but it also affects us as a country, especially because we rely, well, for, for various reasons. I mean, um, 
you know, if you look at what is the, the, the main climate risks in Malaysia, and I've had uh, many conversations with various scientists and climate modelers, and from the input that I've, that I've obtained, uh, that the biggest climate risk in Malaysia is actually flood risk. Uh, in other countries, it's different. In Japan, it could be typhoon. In the United States, it could be heat wave. But in Malaysia, it's flood risk. And the reason is because look at our coastlines. I mean, we are surrounded by sea. I mean, case in point, I mean, if you look at the size of our country, it's, you know, more or less you know, more or less about, um, you know, the size of, of Germany. Germany could be bigger. But if you look at our, our coastlines, our coastline is actually 50% more than Germany. So, so because of that, um, a lot of our um, uh, assets and infrastructure located on the coastlines and residential properties, you know, are actually at the risk of, you know, being submerged, uh, you know, in, you know, in seawater, you know, because of the rising temperature and also rising sea levels. So it will have an impact, um, you know, De maybe in our lifetime, but definitely to our to our children's lifetime. So, so it's a very serious um, issue indeed. Next, please. Okay. So when we talk about um, ESG framework or ESG response, um, it's actually very, very important to, to understand what are the driving factors or the pressure points uh, which are driving, you know, ESG considerations. So you know, there, there are many stakeholders, but I'm just going to focus on three key one. Uh, num number one, uh, de uh, you know, de depending on, on the industries and, and so on, it could be the regulators. So, so the regulators here, you know, I, you know, it could mean, you know, many, many, many uh, organizations, it could be agencies, it could be the ministries, uh, basically organization that provides uh, oversight um, on, on your business. And, and more and more, we see that many of these oversight bodies are starting to put uh, ESG or sustainability as part of their key uh, supervision um, supervision activity. So uh, regulation is definitely one of them. Uh, number two is investors. Um, you know, the, the likelihood is if you are if you are a listed entity, um, the likelihood is uh, one or many of your institutional investors would care um, about uh, ESG. Uh, because if you look at um, you know large institutional investors in the country, you know such as um, organisations such as PNB and EPF and Coop um, and, and many others, you know in in one way or another they've actually released um, a lot of public statements stating the importance of sustainability as part of their investment decisions. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, yesterday I had a conversation with the chief strategy officer of in, in of one of the largest institutional funds in the in the country and and. He he told me that, you know, uh, the ESG consideration is not just about when they actually do investments, but basically um, for those investing companies that are perceived to not comply or not take sustainability consideration seriously, they are going to take shareholder action. And shareholder action can be brought, you know, it can be a vote, uh, you know, during AGM, um, you know, it can be reducing divestments and, and many others. So if you look at from the perspective of the board of directors and senior management, where, you know, one of the main aim is to increase or maximize shareholders value, then of course, um, you know, the behavior and, and what the institutional investors think uh, will have a big impact um, to to, to your business model. And if we look at some international news recently, we've seen how some, you know, there've been some shareholders revolt in oil and gas companies company around the world where certain board members were removed because they were perceived to be not active enough in pursuing sustainability agenda. Uh, so, so things like that are starting to happen and, and it will continue to happen all over the world, including Malaysia. And, and finally, the customers, something not to be underestimated. Um, you know, some people think that customers um, are quite neutral to this. Some people say that, you know, it's only pockets of people who really care about the environment. Um, you know, but one thing that I can say is the younger generation definitely are starting to take uh, sustainability and ESG considerations more seriously, um, you know, because of social media, because of, um, you know, their, their broader um, point of view uh, in terms of the environment. Um, and, and, you know, more and more, it will start, you know, getting into our political discourse as well, you know, because, for example, if we look at some um, countries, uh, especially in, in Europe, you know, the discourse of the environment actually go, goes at the, at the political level. Uh, so, you know, things like this will only become more and more prevalent, you know, as we go into the future. So, therefore, if we look at the summary, in terms of regulation, investors and customers, each of these components are actually driving the, the, the ESG factors and, and because of 
that, it is very important for organizations um, in the industry to have uh, a very strong idea what they want to do about this issue and, and craft a framework about it. I will, I will explain later what framework is all about because sometimes there's been a lot of discussion. What's the difference between framework and policy? Do we need a framework? Uh, is it just a fluff word and, and so on? Uh, so, so I'm going to explain to you, but to me, uh, a framework is basically a set of overarching principles that define um, how um, your, you, you intend to undertake a certain strategy. And in this particular case, is the sustainability strategy. Yeah. Next, please. Okay. Right. Okay. So when we talk about framework, there are actually more than a dozen framework um, out there. Uh, it's not just these five, but um, I've decided to, to to put you know the five key ones that 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 you know that that are frequently mentioned. Um, so uh, you know you have uh, frameworks such as GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, uh, TCFD. Uh, GRI and TCFD are, are you know are referred to in the Bruce Sustain Sustainable Reporting Guidelines. Um, and then you also have integrated reporting, CDSB, and so on. Okay, so so there are a lot of similarity. There are also some slight differences. So for example, um, some framework uh, they are focused on climate risk uh, case. In point being uh, TCFD uh, and also climate disclosure standard board framework, uh, whereas um, other frameworks such as uh, GRI, integrated reporting tend to be broader. Uh, it covers the, the, the whole ESG uh, considerations. Um, SASB is very interesting. It's, it's very prescriptive and it's very detailed. Uh, it has uh, 77 industry specific standards and associated matrix and also risk assessment, including the oil and gas industry. Uh, so, so that's also worthwhile uh, um, exploring. But uh, what, what I want to say is that um, unless if you know you, you have a specific reason um, to, to, to basically conform to a certain standard, you know, so for example, um, I, um, you know, in the banking industry, for example, um, in, in some countries around the world, such as in the UK and Singapore, uh, the banking regulator requires uh, the banking institution to uh, disclose uh, their reporting in line with uh, TCFD. So, so there is a specific directive in there. But you know, if you don't have any specific directive, then you know what's most important is to look at uh, what are the, the key components of each of these framework and basically uh, take um, you know the, the best of it, if you will, to 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 build uh, your your own ESG framework in your own organization. Okay, next. Okay, um, so so let's talk about. Oh, Firstly, why is framework important? What is it for? And, and number two, I will talk about what are the common key components within the framework? So, so let's address uh, the, the first one first. Why is um, a, a framework important? Now, you know, let's, let's imagine, you know, Let's imagine um, a situation without um, a framework. So, so I would argue that even without a framework, um, organizations would have, uh, many people would have an intuitive sense on what are things that they should do that is good for the community and the society. So for example, the previous speaker talked about having an inclusive policy, it's about educating the community, uh, it's about protecting the environment and so on. And indeed, if we look at um, the trajectory of many organizations during the last 20 years, you know, many organizations have actually engaged in CSI activities, uh, which are, you know, you know which are basically a good set of activities. But, you know, now that we know that these activities are fairly intuitive and people would understand that, why do we need a framework? It actually goes back to, to your stakeholders because the fact is many stakeholders nowadays, they expect ESG considerations to be embedded into your business model and to be reflected as part of how you conduct your business, your strategy. So it's not just about knowing that you have conducted 10 set of 10, a list of 10 um, CSI activities, it goes beyond that. Stakeholders are expecting, they're asking questions such as, um, is this organization uh, helping to reduce carbon emission? Are, are they helping um, you know, Malaysia to, to commit uh, to, to reduce its carbon emission by 2030 and go net zero by 2050? Um, you know, are they um, recognizing the, the opportunity and risk uh, as a result of climate risk or ESG risk? And how are they responding to that? So, so because, you know, the set of questions are becoming more and more sophisticated and your stakeholders 
typically drive these questions is it's very important for, for a framework to exist to basically tie off all of these processes and activities together. So, so each of your activity is not an isolated um, set of, of initiative, but basically they are cohesive, they are integrated, and they are, they are basically um, you know, in line to a certain objective or direction. So, so to me, I would argue that's the main reason why um, an ESG framework is important, uh, because it gives a sense of direction of what you're doing, uh, not an isolated set of activities. Uh, so, so within within the framework, um, you know, uh, I've, I've basically taken this from TCFD, which is one of the of the five framework that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but you know, if you look at um, if you read all of the framework, all of them talk about governance, all of them talk about risk management and and strategy. Uh, TCFD goes a bit further by talking about matrix targets and also scenario analysis. But you know, apart from those little nuances, you know, a lot of the framework basically talk about the same thing. And and I'm not just talking, I'm not just saying this from my own personal point of view. Uh, there have been many initiatives uh, conducted by, you know, you can check a corporate a dialogue project or better alignment project, which basically does a comparison between various framework. Um, and, you know, many of the studies suggest that actually there are a lot of overlap between, between the framework. So for the purpose of today's discussion, I will be talking about governance, strategy, risk management, and matrix. And then after that, we will summarize, you know, so that we can talk about how you can bring all of this together as part of a cohesive framework. Next. Right. Um, so, so this is just for information. Um, so TCFD, for example, have a set of recommendations that talks about what are the things that you have to disclose within governance, strategy, risk management, and matrix. So, so you can see in there, and, and from here, we can get some idea or some indication how exactly that framework should look like. You know, because it, it, it does not just talk about what is your strategy, describe what, what is your strategy. It also talks about describe the board oversight, the, the management role, uh, describe uh, what are the opportunities and risks that you identify and how do you respond to this. And it starts going into something very quantitative and detailed as well. It talks about uh, disclose scope one, scope two, and scope three of the GHG emission. So, so from, from there, you, you can see that um, a, a framework is not just about uh, making sure that you have a set of, of basically uh, policies or a policy statement, but it's also about having um, a, um, you know, a, a monitoring process about measuring mechanism uh, about how to measure the, the carbon emission that your organization produce. Uh, it's also about integrating climate risk or ESG risk into your risk management framework. So, so it's actually a broad set of considerations. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna do now is to talk about each of the four component one by one. Okay, next. Okay. Right. Um, so next is on the topic of governance. So, so let's go. Um, let's let's take a step back and, and consider this this key question. Uh, why is um, governance uh, important? It's very important because um, if your objective is to ensure that there is a cohesive set of um, ESG response within your organization, then the question that you might you you or your stakeholders might have is. Uh, who's looking after this? Where is the oversight? What's the oversight at the board level and at the senior management level? Which committee that looks at this? Is this part of your agenda? Um, you know, what are the, the, the monitoring mechanism or the kind of reporting that the board and the committee gets uh, in order to make uh, decisions with regards to ESG risks? risks? And, and more importantly, it's about incentivization or performance evaluation or KPI. Because, you know, if you look at, um, you know, many of the corporate governance framework around the world, you know, including the latest MC CCG 2021, uh, it talks about, you know, embedding climate risk into your performance consideration. So, so what, what this means is that governance is not just about um, making sure that you update your board's term of reference, uh, working committee terms of reference, and so on. You have to start thinking about it in, in the form of KPI. So, you know, how do you reward your management? Is it just a matter of producing as much profit or as much production during the year? Or is there going to be a KPI with regards to the amount of energy saved, you know, the, the amount of carbon emitted from the operations and the rest of it. So the topic of governance goes much deeper than just having a terms of reference. Uh, and also in this slide, um, I've basically attached, um, uh, put, uh, you know, a very good reference to, to the considerations in governance. It's published by World Economic Forum. Uh, you can Google the title after this. Uh, the document is available publicly. Uh, it, it provides a very good insight in terms of what are the key 
um, you know, considerations that, that that should be embedded into your into your governance framework. Yeah. Next. So next, we, we talk about strategy. So again, going back, to looking at it from the perspective of your stakeholders, um, their question is not how many CSI activities that you have done, but the question is more sophisticated than that. You know, when it comes to ESG risk or climate risk, what are the, the, the risks and opportunities that you have identified? Because when you think about it, a strategy is basically a response, a set of response to uh, opportunity and risk that's available in your industry. So if you look at, for example, risks um, you know in, in the oil and gas industry there have been a lot of sensitive sensitivity with regards to, to climate risk now the question is how does your organization respond to that risk uh, but it's not just about risk it's about opportunities as well so for example development of you know green technology and so on uh, the demand over green products um, so you know the, the, the question that you know many people are thinking is this is the landscape right now when it comes to uh, sustainability. Uh, this is what our stakeholders are demanding. Uh, what is our strategy about it? So uh, I would argue that as part of your ESG framework, the consideration about strategy should be embedded within that framework. What this means is that there need to be a structured process where you identify uh, the, the ESG risks in your organization. There, there should be a structured process where you identify the opportunities uh, where this is discussed and, you know, and, and basically all this information is formulated into your strategy setting process. Um, so, so that's what, um, you know, the, the second part uh, that I would like to, that, uh, that that's very important is the strategy. Uh, next, let's talk about risk management. So, so many organizations would have some level of uh, risk management framework or ERM framework in the organization, but the question is, has this, uh, and typically many ERM framework takes into account financial risk, reputational risk, and so on. Now, when it comes to ESG, the, the question is, has ESG risk been taken into account? You know, for example, uh, climate risk, you know, has it been reflected into your risk appetite statement? Because risk appetite statement is one of the key component of, of an ERM framework. Um, how has this been embedded into your ERM framework in terms of monitoring? So, for example, um, you know, do you actually uh, monitor the kind of uh, climate risk, uh, the, the kind of uh, your your assets or investments that could be exposed to climate risk and and transition risk? W what is transition risk? Um, so, so basically, transition risk refers to changes in laws and regulation, which you know, uh, which uh, ha will have an impact uh, to to your organization. So, when we talk about risk. Typically in the in the ESG uh, conversation, people talk about physical risk, which is the risk of natural disasters, flooding, and so on, and transitional risk. So, for example, if you look at um, you know many car companies uh, in Europe right now, many of them actually have to change um, and recalibrate their engine size to go to 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 lower engine, and the reason is because of carbon tax. You know the the the, the bigger the more emission the engine produce, the more tax they have to pay, and 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 the thing is this. Um, the fact that we are located in Malaysia and some of these regulations are happening uh, 10,000 miles away from us does not mean that we are not affected. And the reason is because we are an export-oriented company. Uh, many organizations in this country are part of a global supply chain. So, for example, if you look at some of the latest legislations that's been passed in the EU right now that talks about carbon emissions, that talks about EU taxonomy and the rest of it, it's basically designed to reduce reduce the amount of carbon emission and it's not just for organizations that are located in Europe but across the supply chain as well. So if you are part of a global supply chain and you do not conform uh, to some of these standards, there is a risk that you know, um, you know, the, 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 the customer might relook at their global supply chain and, and, and relook at you know, whether they want to do business with you or not. You know, and the, the reason why it, it's, it's heading towards, towards, towards that direction is because they are required to report not just the amount of emission that the, the companies are producing, but also across their supply chain. So, so basically the point is regulations that's happening 10,000 miles away from us can and have an impact to us, and because of that, it exposed to uh, a risk uh, to to the companies, uh, you know, in, in in the industry. Next, 
Uh, and finally, I just like to talk about uh, metrics and targets because uh, no framework is complete without uh, some level of uh, objective or targets. Um, so, you know, depending on different industry, um, typically from what I've seen when it comes to um, climate, uh, many of the metrics or targets are conducted in the form of climate intensity. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, how, how intensive the climate per Per kilowatt of energy, for example, um, and and we've seen uh, evidence that more and more companies are starting to put targets. I think targets such as net zero is is very important, but it's definitely not the only target available because that target has to be cascaded down um, at the at the operational level. How much? energy that you intend to, to, to save during the year, um, you know, how much carbon emission that you intend to reduce over the year and the rest of it. Okay, so I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting to, to the end of the, I'm getting um, to the end of the, of, of the time here. So, so I think I'm going to summarize very, very quickly and then we can open to question and answer. Next, please. Um, so, so in terms of, in summary, what I would like to say that ESG agenda will become more and more important in the future. It will, it's on the increasing trajectory, not, not less. The reason is because stakeholders, regulations, uh, institutional investors, and your customers are demanding it. It's very important to have clarity about what exactly is the ESG strategy in your organization. Uh, going back to what I say, there is a difference between CSR and C ESG. CSR is a set of activities which are good to the community. ESG is, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a different thing. It's a lot more embedded into your business considerations. Uh, when it comes to uh, climate risks, uh, sometimes you know you might have some, some credit, so you might need to um, uh, understand that. Uh, there could be some implementation challenges and therefore there should be some some long-term roadmap about this. Uh, so, so I think I'll just stop here right now and I, I give it back to you, Farah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nick. Shares a very impressive and, in, and informative sharings that definitely will be useful to our members here. Um, probably, um, okay, I think I'm just going to take one question. Yeah, if you can, um, uh, you know, advise based on your experience and expertise, short and sweet answer will, will do. So um, for, for industry and companies, right, what would be a systematic structured way to measure its uh, performance on sustainability and how should such measurement be done and used to rank company performance? And uh, the last one, similarly, what kind of measure, measurements would bankers, investors use to assess, evaluate companies' performance on SDG? Okay, very, very good set of question, Farah. Um, it might take me half an hour to, to explain all of that in detail, but I'll try to yeah. do it within two minutes. I think number one, I will make a very clear distinction between uh, performance uh, evaluation uh, and also ranking, uh, because ranking is basically based on the methodology of that ranking agency, which might have, um, you know, some slightly different nuances in terms of how they rank uh, the, the ESG of one organization to, to the others. But when we talk about performance, it, it would actually go back to the strategy of, of your organization and what ex and, and based on that strategy, you then decide what is uh, the performance metrics that you want to apply. But generally speaking, it goes back to what is your objective when it comes to the environment, to social and, and, and governance, you know. Typically, when it comes to environment, people talk about air pollution and you know water pollution. Uh, not not the only thing, of course, but you know th those are the common ones. So so therefore, that the matrix should be somewhere around you know carbon emission. Now, if your organization don't track and measure carbon carbon emission, then of course that's something which is like a big gap within the whole you know ESG factor, uh, because you know more and more stakeholders are expecting you to measure your scope one scope. Two and scope three emission. Uh, when it comes to social, uh, it tends to be you know a lot more with regards to um, you know human rights and labor protection rights and diversity. So I've seen some organization where they have a diversity um, you know f um, uh, gender diversity um, aspirations within the organization and and so on. Um, governance can be in terms of you know which disclosure uh, framework that you intend to apply because governance is also about having a good set of information. So so those are the common one that I've seen, but in the and it goes back to your strategy uh, and it goes back to what you intend to do to respond to the to the ESG uh, risk. Um, so so that would be my response. Sorry, and, and your last question is about, uh, sorry, can you remind me again? Oh, sorry, Farah, can, can you say that again? You're on mute, please. Sorry. Okay, what kind of measurements would bankers, investors use oh, to banks. assess yeah, yep. the yep. companies? Right. Okay. So, so right now, um, the the topic of uh, um, 
it is still a, a very early time, a very early journey within our banking community when it comes to to to, to ESG. I would argue that you know we are we are quite quite advanced in the region, but but globally we, we still have a long way to go. So so from from my conversations, I've started to see that more and more banks and institutional investors they are starting. Okay, let's start with banks. Uh, you know because the way banks operate is a bit different than institutional investors. So so banks they you know. A, a, Predominantly, it's about uh, credit risk. So, so many banks are currently doing a stress test or scenario analysis to their credit portfolio to to assess what what are the which are the industry which are perceived to be sensitive or at the risk of losses because of uh, physical and transitional risk. Um, and you know, so for example, we've seen a number of banks in Malaysia that have made a policy statement saying that they are not going to finance uh, coal power plants anymore and they are reducing their weighting on a certain sectors. Uh, so, so definitely as part of the bank consideration they are starting to look at uh, the same thing that I say, do you have an ESG framework? Uh, do you start measuring your carbon emission? Do you have a yeah. risk management process? And, and the same with uh, investors as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chitney. Um, okay, we come um, to uh, the last um, closing remarks. All right. Next, uh, please join me to welcome Captain Ahmad Imran Mazmi, Moxie Executive Committee Member and Sustainable Development Working Group Mentor for his closing remarks. All right. Uh, thank you, Farah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have reached to the end of our Sustainable Development in the oil and gas industry, the way forward session. First and foremost, on behalf of SBWG and Moxie, we would like to express our appreciation to our distinguished speakers for their valuable contribution to our webinar today. My deepest gratitude goes to all of you who attended today's session and especially to those who have helped to make it such a successful event. Our SDWG committee members, uh, chaired by our Dr. No Sadatu Akbar, Moxie Secretariat, our event partners and sponsors. Uh, the key message Emerging from today's session, I think can be summed up in three key points. Number one, sustainable development is the way forward and must be embraced by all. Number two, oil and gas industry players must play a key role in achieving sustainable development and the net zero carbon objective. And number three, ESG matters to the oil and gas industry. Together, leaders in our industry must collaborate to safeguard a more sustainable future our commitment to this journey will have a positive impact to people, our communities, and the planet. Together, we can make it happen. If we meet again in our upcoming event, stay tuned. Please don't leave here uh, because we have our co-host session where the vouchers can be won. So please stay for those who want to get the Starbucks and the Eon vouchers. Till we meet again, thank you everyone. All right, short, nice and sweet. Once again, uh, just a kind reminder, please uh, fill up the feedback form and also for MBOT members uh, to obtain the CPD points. You uh, can find uh, the link in the chat box. Um, Raimi, um, can you share the, the survey link in the chat box? All right, don't forget to fill up the feedback form once again. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end and also the fun part of today's event. We're going to have a short Kahoot uh, quiz. Um, and if possible, yeah, for you guys to join from your mobile as the question will be displayed from the screen and you may need to just answer from your mobile. OK, please also join uh, with your own name. Yeah, because um, uh, for the verif verification later. So please also join with your own name. And you will be given 30 seconds to answer all the questions. We have five questions. All right, you may join uh, from the link shown in the screen. Yeah, www.kahoot.it. And please enter the game pin. Yeah. So uh, we will we shall wait for more people who's going to participate as you may stand a chance to win a vouchers.
I will give another two or three minutes, yeah, for you guys to join because I know it will take a while to, uh, you know, to go to the link and enter the pin with your details. Any more to join? Because once we lock, then you can't enter. <laughs> so you have to join now. You have to enter now. <laughs> I think we have almost uh, almost 100 attendees today. Yeah, come on. Let's go. <laughs> Thirty-nine people now. Okay, I think I think we probably uh, have about forty people now. All right. Um, so, are you guys ready? Okay. Um, all right, me. Shall we start? So, the first question: How many UN Sustainable Development Goals are there? We still have a wrong answer, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, next. Okay, we have MRK, ANW, Satish. All right. Okay, next question. Climate action is a digital number. It's all a motor, I mean. You can see the answer. <laughs> all right, we have about 27 got the right answers. Okay, next. We have Kyril Anwar on the leading scoreboard. Okay, next qu next question, please. Petronas declared their aspiration to achieve net zero carbon emission by what year? I think this is in my introduction. <laughs> Yeah, we have most of us got the answer right. Okay, next. Kyrie Anwar still leading the scoreboard. <laughs> okay, next. This is from our sponsors, Malaysia Airline. What are the benefits of Malaysia Airline Bispro? MH Bispro. This could be a tricky one, right? But you have all the answer in the screen, I think. All right. Okay, uh, last question. I think there's a last question. What is ESG stands for? This is easy. Easy cake. We still have people who answer wrong. All right, I think we come to the end. Let's see who's the winner. So we have Kyril Anwar. Kyril Anwar is the winner. All right, congratulations to all the winners. Yeah, please reach our secretariat to claim your prizes. Yeah, with that, 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers once again, each and every one of you for joining the event to the Sustainable Working Group and Moxie Secretariat for organizing this event. To our event sponsor, Velasto Energy, and our Kahu sponsor, Aviva and Malaysia Airlines, we hope to have more of this event in near future for better future. With that, thank you, take care, and stay safe. Bye-bye.